for being here. Anybody come ready to worship God this morning? Yeah. Come on, let's sing now. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. There is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won. We've already won. Everybody in the room, put your hands together now. Come on. Let's sing. And there is no weapon that is ever left a mark on you. There is no army with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with
glad to have you with us. Uh, my name is Josh, and um, we take time to pause like this in the middle of our, our worship set every week, really, because it's good to remember what we're doing. So, you know, if you come to church a lot, um, you get sort of used to it. I think this is, this is true with most things in life, actually, is that when you have something really great or amazing, 
and you know, you're just around it every day or every week. You just get used to something that actually is incredible. And so I just wanna take a, a moment to reflect on what this is, because the truth is, is that the God of the universe who created us, who formed the earth, who is like we're singing, he's above it all. There's no one who can rival him. That same God has chosen to be in relationship with you and me. And that is a beautiful thing that we can't take for granted. Yeah. So, so what, what does this mean? It means this morning, no matter how you feel internally, even if you're going through stuff, God sees you. God has not forgotten about you. God has not given up on you. God has your back. And so as we take time to sing this next song, we're gonna just lift up our, our eyes to Jesus and the one who deserves our worship. And, and if you're newer, let me just say, maybe you've been coming for a little bit and you're not super used to this kind of thing. I don't wanna make you feel pressure to do something you're not comfortable with, but I do wanna encourage you to sing with us and to mean what you're singing. So as we get ready to sing the song, why don't we all, wherever you're at, close your eyes. We fix our eyes on God now. As we close our eyes, we, we, we look to Jesus. Let's sing now, come on. I lift my voice to sing of your goodness. I lift my voice to sing of your love. I lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus, our Savior. You're worthy of it. That's what it's all about. Let's sing that again now. I lift my voice to sing of your goodness. I lift my voice to sing of your love. I lift my voice to sing hallelujah. Jesus, our Savior. You're worthy of it all. Now all together, can we lift our hands to him as we sing it? So we give you the highest praise. Yeah. We give you the highest. Come on, sing it out now. So we give you the Because Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. That's why we've gathered to worship you. I lift my hands because I'm forgiven. I lift my hands because I'm set free. I've been set free. I lift my hands, a sign of surrender. And Jesus, our Savior,
simple. Just begin to fill this room with his praise. This is what it's all about right here, joining together to lift up the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. So Jesus, we stand together as your church to say that you are worthy. We worship you. We praise you. Yeah, come on, continue to do that for one more minute here. We worship you. Park Church is the year of the Bible. We're emphasizing that in every way, studying it more deeply in life groups, and we encouraged everybody to find a Bible reading plan. We specifically recommended the New Testament on version, the Bible Project plan, and uh, our goal was to sign up 750 people on a, on a Bible reading plan this year, and we exceeded that. This week, 782 of you are now reading the Bible, and that's a great thing. It's not too late to get involved with that. If you have fallen off a little bit, jump back in and make up that time because this is really important for us to engage with the scriptures. And in keeping with that theme, rather than naming our series this week something cool, we just decided to say we're going to study the book of Philippians, right? And so we're going to do that in life groups and we're going to do it, uh, we're going to do it throughout. Now the backdrop theme of the book of Philippians all has to do with soul health, joy, abundance internally. And so I thought we would lead into this particular study by reminding you, you all, many of you, I would say we had 600 or so took this survey in July of last year, and it was like a mental health, soul health survey. And here was some of the data that we collected. So this isn't a national survey. This is an Allison Park Church thing, okay? We ask questions like this. Do you feel like you're currently having fun and enjoying life? And only 40% of us said yes. Uh, 45% said, ah, not so much, sometimes maybe. And 13% said no. We asked the question, do you feel you have adequate, su adequate support for your mental, spiritual, and emotional health? 48% said yes, but over half, 52% combined said, ah, not, not really. I think that I could use a little bit more than what I have. Number three, do you feel accountable? Do you have strong accountability from others? And this is actually the lowest yes, 43%. And notice the no's on this was 23%. There's no one that I feel really knows what's going on in my life checking in with me, making sure I'm doing okay. Wow, that's intense. Um, do you feel that you're seen, encouraged by those in your current community? 49% said yes, but even on this one, a more than a majority said sort of, not really in that category of those two things. And then the final, this was the most positive of all of the ones. Do you feel that you're learning and have adequate resources to grow? 58% yes, and again, the rest said either somewhat or no. Do you know what that says to me? That says this. Over half of us, most days, feel like we're not really enjoying our lives. We are not really seen and encouraged. 
There are times when we feel like we lack accountability and mentorship. And overall, the health of our soul isn't quite what we would like it to be. Now, I don't think that's unique to Allison Park Church. (laughs) We live in the last couple of years where everybody has experienced the impact of isolation and all of the other turmoil that's gone on so that most of us are searching somewhere for some mental health or soul health solutions. In fact, this is a big topic in our culture right now. How do we find that? Where do we find that? And so Philippians is a study in the scriptures that aims in that direction. So I think it's going to be helpful in that regard. But because, I don't know about you, but that really... When I saw the results of that study, I was like, we have some work to do, right? And so, so I don't want to give you the impression that I think so much about my preaching ministry that I could preach one series on the book of Philippians and solve it all. Wouldn't that be great, huh? No, no, no. I, I realize this is more than a sermon series. There has to be some more things that happen in order for us to address this properly. One thing we'll tell you is that on the Alice Park website, there is now a web page that's a resource page for mental health. And if you are looking for, you know, where do I search to find some things that might be helpful to me, that, that's an important place to go to. I, I think we're also, as a team, as a staff, we're wrestling through what else can we do to be more effective in this regard. One of the things that I think will be helpful for us is we're going to study the scripture, not just from sermon on the weekend, but also in our life groups where the life groups are going to interact around these soul health issues out of the book of Philippians, which will all take us to, I think, a better place. So all those things combined is where we're headed over the next few weeks together. Does that sound all right? Okay, book of Philippians we're going to study. Before we get into this, you can take your Bibles and go there. Philippians chapter 1. This has got four chapters in it. It's a New Testament uh, letter that Paul writes to this church that he helped to plant in Greece in the city of Philippi. That's why we call it Philippians. And we're going to read the first 11 verses in a moment. But let me just set this up before we read, okay? So sometimes it's difficult to get advice from people when you're going through a difficult situation and the person you are getting advice from is in a better situation than you are. And they give you trite statements to make it feel better. Does anyone else like me feel that way? Like, okay, you have a great job and just got promoted. I just lost my job and you want to tell me, you know, when the Lord closes a door, he'll open a window and you want to say, da, 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 right? Like, get out of my face, right? So, so, you know, you're in this wonderful marriage relationship and I'm single. We just broke up and you want to say, you know, he had to leave. She had to leave or you wouldn't find God's will. And you want to say, that may be true, but I do not want to hear it from you right? You know what I'm saying? Like somebody else might be, could tell me that, but not you, not right now. Okay. So, so listen, Paul is talking to us about soul health and it's good to understand that Paul is coming from a place where he can speak into our situation because it's not like he's writing from a mountaintop someplace in this really big house with all of his needs met. Actually, Paul is writing, this is one of what we call the prison epistles. Epistle means letter. Okay, it's a letter that Paul wrote from prison. He's actually in Rome. Most people believe this is 62 AD, so just about 30 years after the resurrection of Christ. And he is two years away from being martyred. So he's in prison. He's going to stand before the Roman version of the Supreme Court. He's two years away from being killed, his head cut off for his faith in Christ. And out of that prison experience, he's writing to us, to the Philippian church and to us, about how to have an abundant soul, okay? Now I'm curious. Okay, the other thing is the Philippian church, not only were they receiving a letter from Paul who was in prison... They actually had met Paul when he was in prison in Philippi. And if you want to read the backstory of this book, you find it in Acts chapter 16, which is the history of the early church. And where do we meet Paul in Philippi? He shows up in Philippi, has a little bit of success. Some people come to Christ. And then he is going through town preaching the gospel. And he meets this girl who's shouting behind him, causing all kinds of problems because she's possessed by a demon, an evil spirit. And he turns and rebukes the demon. And and she's set free. But there were some men who were abusing her, owning her, and using her psychic abilities for their welfare. And, and, and so they get mad, and they have Paul and his companion Silas beaten with rods, okay? Sometimes we talk like this in the scripture, and pastors say this, and then we just forget to slow down and think about what this means. Now, they tied him to a pole, and they took a big old stick, and they 
pounded his back with it. Can you see this now? So here he is, and the rod there is, and he hit him again, and they take him off of that pole, and they put him in a dungeon, and they chain him to the wall. And Paul and Silas, in, in the middle of the night, their backs bleeding in this dungeon situation, make the decision to worship instead of complain. And as they begin to sing songs at midnight, the Bible says God sends an earthquake, and they are let out of the prison, and the jail thinks he's gonna die. jailer thinks he's going to die. So he gives his life to Christ. His whole family gets saved. They have this 3.30 in the morning baptism service, a huge revival. And that's how the church at Philippi gets started. And Paul is writing back to this group of people that got started out of his prison experience revival. And he's writing from prison again. And he's saying them to this, he's saying this to them. He's saying, I wish you guys could be like me. <laughs> Not the chains, not the prison, not the bad circumstances. But in chapter four, he actually says, whatever you've seen and heard from me, put it into practice and you will have peace. He says, look, I just want to tell you, my soul is doing great here in prison, here in this circumstance. I have learned, he says in chapter four, the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. Look, Paul is writing from a difficult place about having an abundant, healthy soul. And he's speaking not just to these people in that era, but he speaks to us today. So now I'm leaning forward. Okay, this is not a perfect situation. What would we hear from Paul? We'll summarize like this is sort of a way to summarize the whole series as well as today's message. The most important factor in maintaining a healthy soul, Paul would say to us out of Philippians, is not so much what's happening to you, although it's great when, when circumstances are, are pleasant, right? It's great when it's 50 degrees in February, right? Come on, it's, there's some things you're like, ah, my soul is, is happy and the rest of me too, right? But it's not always what's happening to you. It's also what's happening in you and around you, in you and around you. We're going to talk about those two things as we start this series. Most important factor in maintaining a healthy soul is not what's happening to you. It's what's happening in you and around you. Okay, let's read the scripture now. Chapter 1, Philippians verse 1. Paul writes to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus in Philippi. He's now addressing the church there, those who had come to Christ in this city that he had planted there. Together with overseers and deacons, he calls out in honor those who he put into leadership there. So remember, he knows these folks. He installed them in this place. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, which is a very common greeting that Paul gave when he wrote his letters. This is what I want for you. I want you to be in the grace of God and living in the peace of God from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you every time, excuse me, I thank God every time I remember you. Now he gets real personal. Now remember, he is, he's in prison in Rome. He has got some kind of a quill and some ink. Either a scribe is writing it for him or he's penning it himself. And he begins now to be personal with them. He says, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Because of your partnership. He's like, you know what I'm going through here. And, and when I just think of you guys, I just am filled with joy because you have partnered with me in the gospel from the first day until now. I know I feel alone sometimes, but I'm not alone because I know you're out there right now. Now, Paul's putting this in a scroll. It's going to go by boat and then by horse and then by foot. And it's going to get to these folks. And he doesn't have a way to text them and get a text message back. He can't DM them on Instagram and hope to get something back right away. He's got to wait for a reply. Later in chapter two, he says, look, you guys, you guys were so kind. You sent to me Tim from your church and you sent to me Epaphroditus and this guy almost died to be able to get support to me and I can't tell you how grateful I am in this dark hour of my life for the partnership that I've had with you from the first day until now then he goes verse six into what is my life verse my favorite verse in all the bible right here being confident of this that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Can you read that out loud with me? Read it with me. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then he goes back into his feelings about them. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. I, I know what you're like. I know how much you love me. I know how we're together in this. And while there's distance that separates us, Oh, I'm so thankful for you. For whether I'm in chains, 
which is what was happening in his life right then, or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you. I wish I was out of this prison cell. I, was, I wish I was there in Philippi. I, 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 wish we, I wish we were sitting down to have some good food together, but here I am, but I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus, and this is my prayer, that your love might abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Now, that gets us started in the book of Philippians. We're just going to cover these first 11 verses today. We'll get into the rest of the book as we journey over the next few weeks. But we could say, out of Paul's writings, just these 11 verses, that there were three choices, or there are three choices, that we have to make to get ourselves in a healthier place. Okay, if our soul, if your soul right now is empty, if you're feeling frustrated, if you feel down and discouraged, if you feel like there isn't enough support, you're not being seen, you're not having fun, there's not something inside that's good right now, and you're frustrated with that, there are some choices that Paul recommends out of his own life that we, that we make. Actually, we see it sort of implicitly in this passage because he makes these choices and we can imitate him in this. Let me give you these three choices. First choice is this. I choose, or I need to choose, to build healthy partnerships to surround my life. Paul says, look, I know I'm not alone. I feel alone. I'm distant from you. But I have worked on relationship with you and you with me so that I know you share in my sufferings. I feel the encouragement of being present with you in spirit, even though we can't be physically present. Paul had taken the time ahead of this crisis to work on friendships and partnerships so that at the time he needed it the most, he had a community to surround him. So let me just remind you, I've probably said this many times because I've been pastoring here a long time, and if you've heard me preach a lot, I always say I'm not designed as a counselor. I didn't get training as a counselor, so I don't really do much counseling, although we have association with people who are really capable at that. I do more strategic planning, okay? So when somebody comes to me and they say, here's the problem I have, Pastor, I will sit down and say, okay, let's map out options and steps that you could take to build your way into a, a solution somehow. And in an hour or so, we take the time to map it out. Almost always, a part of that strategy involves building a network of support around your life. I'm going to probably say to you, okay, there are several key things you need in your life to get through this. You're going to need friends. And by the way, they say in a local church, you don't feel quite like you're at home until you made seven friends. And when you've made seven significant friends, it doesn't matter how big or how small the church is, you feel like you're connected in that place. So you probably need a group of friends that are going to be with you. You probably need a mentor in your life that can speak into your situation. You might need some expertise. You might need some counseling. There might need to be a financial advisor involved here. You probably need a pastor. I can fill that role. Like there needs to be a network of support that surrounds your life. And look, that isn't just true for crises. That's the way to live healthy where there's always a network of support surrounding your life. Now, we tend to over-spiritualize how that develops. Let me explain. Sometimes because it's a spiritual thing and it's church, we come into it like this. God, I feel so alone. I'm going to go to church today. And Lord, if you really love me, we put this huge condition on it. If you really love me and you want me to get through this, send someone to me and have them say these three words. And then I will know, like, give me a sign. Look, let me just reduce it down. Building a network of support around your life does not need signs and wonders. There are people that are here that love you. I just want to say, I, I want to be your pastor. And, you know, it actually teaches us in James, if anyone's sick among you, they should call the elders of the church. They should wave their hand and say, hey, over here, I'm not doing good. Okay, so I just made the announcement to you right now. I said, look, our congregation has, has expressed through survey that more than half of us are feeling a little bit unsupported and unseen. That may not necessarily be the church's fault, but it is our reality. And so now we're saying, okay, we created a website for that. That's great, but that's not real personal. That's a pull, right? You got to go get that. So, so we're saying, if you are going through it right now, we want to be in your life. You might be thinking, yeah, but Pastor Jeff, there's a lot of us. If we all call you this week, how will you ever answer all those phone calls? Okay, I get that. Let me just tell you, I would rather have that problem 
of trying to figure out what to do with all the people who are raising their hands saying, I need some help, than to have the problem we currently have, which is that too many people feel isolated. So you let us worry about the intake question. You're like, okay, I don't know. How will, who will get back to me? I don't know yet either. But here's the deal. We're going to figure this out because what I don't want you to do is sit back thinking that somehow you are not valued here or that people don't care about you because I guarantee you there are people in the room ready to step up. And, and we may not have the solutions for all the problems you're going through, but at least we can say we'll stand beside you, we'll pray with you, we'll walk with you in this journey because isn't that what we're supposed to be about, right? Come on. So I think, that, listen, we have to both be intentional. On my end and on your end, you have to be willing to say, all right, I want to engage. And if you're doing great right now, if you're doing great right now, there is somebody else who needs you. Okay? So, so let's talk about it. We have to take responsibility to build partnerships around our life. And it has to be the right kind of partnerships. Let me explain. I was just at a conference this week, and I heard a pastor, Ray Johnston, and he was talking, and he said, there is a disease, and he described this disease that has four qualities to it, or four ways of defining it. It is the dis disease called discouragement. First, he said, discouragement is a universal disease. Universal, that means everybody catches it, right? In fact, just as a show of honesty, how many of you would say, sometime over the last few weeks, I have been discouraged at some point. How many of you would, would admit that? Yeah, okay. Look around, and the ones who don't have hands up, they're lying. Okay, let me just tell you right now. <laughs> okay, so we all catch it. It's just universal. Okay, second, second, second. It's repeating. You don't just catch it once. You catch it a bunch of times over and over and over, right? And so, look, you don't just discourage, just get discouraged this week. How many of you got discouraged in January at least once? Anybody? How many of you in 2022 would admit you got discouraged? Okay, it happens. It's repeating. Okay, number three. First, we said it's universal. Number two, it's repeating. Number three, it's contagious. <gasps> yeah, which means if you're going to build partnership or network around your life, you need to build encouragers into the system. Now you say, but pastor, we're supposed to be there for each other. What if my friend is discouraged? Okay, we pick each other up. Look, look, look. If someone else is discouraged, it's not going to, you know, say, I'm going to stay away from them. They're going to rub off on me. No, no, no. We encourage each other in the Lord. But look, there are some folks in your life that are committed to discouragement. Like, it's just who they are. It's, it's their identity. Like, if you happen to be in the same pit together and start crawling out, they will grab you by the belt and yank you back down because they just cannot stand that anybody would be happy in this miserable world we live in. And how many of you know someone? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> listen, listen. You know what I'm talking about. So, so look, it's not that you're cutting off relationship with them. No, no, no. It's that your primary relationships need to be with people who are life speakers, who are, look, we want to be the kind of church that speaks life and encouragement because we so desperately need it. And here's the fourth criteria about discouragement. It's universal, it's repeating, it's contagious. And number four, and this one took my breath away when I heard it. Discouragement, he said, is like the anesthetic that the devil uses on you to get you prepped so that he can carve out your heart. <laughs> I know, didn't that take your breath away? Listen, listen. The devil, it, one of his tools is to keep you discouraged. The Holy Spirit, on the other hand, breathes joy. So, so look, it's not to say that if you're discouraged, you're in sin. What we are saying is that is a weapon of the enemy that, that he wants to use against you to take your heart away from you so that you won't want to go on. And this is where you need people around you who, when you feel like you have no heart left, are there to stand by your side and say, you can do this. We're praying for you. We're believing in you. Look, God has purpose on you. Look, because we need those partnerships built around our life. And what do you need? Life speakers who will do number two. And here's the second thing that we need to choose to do. I choose to remember that God has a purpose for my life that he will never stop working to complete. 
in my life. What is my favorite verse? Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in me will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Look, you are not here on accident. God is not tolerating you. He has a design on your life. And when you've given up on yourself and don't feel like you can go on, there is never a moment in your existence when God quits on you. He keeps on working on your behalf even when you don't feel it, even when you can't see it, even when you don't want to work for yourself. There is a God in heaven who keeps working on your future, on the purpose he's assigned to you. No matter what has gone on, no matter how many times you fail, no matter how many times you think he should just go away, he always will be faithful to fulfill his purpose until the day of Christ Jesus. So there's a day... When we finished our race and we fought the good fight and we'll go on from this life to the next and we'll receive our reward. But that day is not today. Well, we don't know for sure. <laughs> but if we happen to make it through today, God will have worked all the way through today to fulfill his purpose for your life. Now, this is tied, I think, to something else that has to do with soul health. And let me talk for a moment now about our culture. I think there's probably never been a time in history where there's been more written about soul health than today. It's a topic of conversation all over the place. And it's an epidemic and crisis in our world. And I'm starting to think it's not that there's not enough information available. That's one problem, getting good information. I think some of it has to do with a trend within our culture. Here's what I'll say. If there is a substitute for the God in our current culture, it is that we put ourselves on the throne where God belongs. And if soul health is your goal, I just want to be healthy, I just want to be happy, and you're searching for that and that's your goal, it ends up being like a fish that you try to squeeze and it squirts out and you pick it up and again it squirts out because you can never quite get this elusive thing called soul health. Soul health actually is not a good goal. It's a better byproduct. Now, what does that mean? Paul said, there's purpose on my life and I will fulfill that purpose with God even at a cost. I'm going to go after, look, Jesus is on the throne of my life and I serve his purpose. And if it means prison for me, I will endure the pain of prison because I'm not just here to be happy. I'm not just here to be healthy. I'm here to fulfill his purpose for my life. And if that means I have to suffer for that, that's okay. Here's one of the reasons why our culture lacks soul health is that we lack meaning. You've got to get up every morning and have a meaning beyond you. If you are the center of everything and you're the meaning of your universe, that is not a love to live for. And when you're suffering through, if you're the be all and end all, then all you are is just a product of the quality of your life today. And that's just not enough to give you purpose and passion. But if you're living for Christ, Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21, we'll talk about it next week. Look, so, so if Paul's goal was soul health, he would have been in Philippi, Philippi walking with Silas and the girl would have been demon possessed and he would have thought with Silas, I don't know if we should cast this demon out right now. You know, we've come through a little bit of a hard time. It's been a challenging few weeks. You get in trouble here if you cast out demons. I probably should just, you know, Philippi has a good beach. Why don't we just take a few minutes down at the Philippi Ramada and, you know, no, no, he cast out the demon. Next thing you know, he's tied to a post and they're beating with him a stick. <laughs> this is not a good soul health moment, right? And then they throw him in a jail and he's chained to the wall. This is not what you build yourself a recipe for a healthy life. But Paul, in the midst of the prison, discovered something, and that is beat me if you want to, jail me if you want to, chain me if you want to. There is nothing that can stop the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. And at midnight, they worshiped, and right there in that broken place, the presence of God filled that prison cell. And he was able to say to the Philippians, what you've seen in me, 
and heard from me. Put these things into practice and you'll have peace. Look, if he was into soul health as his primary goal, he wouldn't be in prison in Rome. He was there for a whole nother reason. And that is when he woke up every morning, his purpose was something beyond him. He was living for a cause greater than himself. And it's funny how when you put Jesus first, what you get in return is everything you've been longing for. But when you put your longings first and him second, what you end up with is emptiness. And part of it has to do with the prioritization of his role in your life. That brings us to the third choice. First, we said we had to put partnership around our life and then we got to Realize he's never going to stop working on his purpose. We need to align with that. And then number three, we need to choose to pray for his presence to fill our life, like in the prison in Philippi, where he began to pray and they began to sing and something in the atmosphere changed. Now, I know this is a little bit of a challenge, what I just laid out for you. I was not trying to preach at you. I was trying to speak into you. Can, can you feel that? If you felt condemned or heavy by that last little section, I'm not trying to put anything on your life. I'm trying to speak into your spirit now a little bit. And I want to do the same thing now as I close this message. Because Paul transitions from that phrase, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And then he shifts. He says, oh, your partnership means so much. I love you so much. I, I find such encouragement from you. And then he says like this, and this is my prayer. And he prayed encouragement into their life on a scroll from a distance, but I believe it still works. This is how we're going to do now. Just turn your face toward heaven. I'm not going to preach at you now. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray Paul's words, and I'm going to pray them into your spirit right now. I told you if you were here at Sacred Assembly, this God said this year is your year of being a trumpet, Jeff. That means lift your voice, pray prophetically, speak prophetically. So I'm going to trumpet these words from Paul into your spirit right now. This is what Paul prayed. He said this, this is my prayer that your love might abound. Let me just pray over you now. I pray that the love of God would just abound in your life, that you would recognize how much he loves you, that he's chosen you, that he's never gonna quit on you, that he would do anything, even the death of his son on the cross, to be able to show you just how much he values you. I pray that that his love over you and the love of God within you would abound, would just explode within your life more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, depth of insight, that God would give you revelation of how good he is and how much he loves you and how much purpose he has on you in the name of Jesus. Can you put your hand on your chest right now? I now want to speak into you. The Bible says then, Paul prayed, that you might be able to discern what is best. I pray that over your spirit right now that God would give you discernment, insight, wisdom, revelation, to discern what is best about the situations in your life, about your marriage right now, about your finances, about the problems you're facing. God would give you discernment that you'd have crystal clarity. I speak that by the Holy Spirit into your spirit right now, discernment as, as, as to what is best. And that you might be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. Okay, not just, not just free from sin, but God would make you whole, that he would make you whole in every way, whole within your soul, whole in your mind and your thinking and your emotions, whole and free from the wounds of the past, the guilt, the shame that you've carried, that he would make you pure and blameless for the day of Christ and that he would fill you with the fruit of righteousness. And Isaiah says the fruit of righteousness is peace. That's what it's defined as. So I pray that God would fill you with peace. <sighs> the peace that passes understanding. That would go past what you're thinking and just be deposited within your soul. That it comes now through Jesus. That it comes now through Jesus. That it comes now through Jesus to his glory and honor and praise. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And everybody would say amen to that. Just lift your face toward heaven and just give him thanks for a moment now. And Sarah, go ahead and come. Just stay seated right where you are. Let's sing this together now in worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but only trust in Jesus' name. Let's see that again. My hope is built.
both stand to our feet. And if you're watching online, this is for you as well. Just with your eyes closed, turn your face toward heaven. We're gonna pray a prayer right now of decision to put Jesus on the throne of our life. If you've never given your life to Christ, this is a great way to pray, to step into faith with Christ, to begin your relationship. But this is for everybody right now. We're gonna have everybody who wants to do this to pray out loud. And we're just gonna make a declaration now. Would you just join me, say this, say, Jesus, I thank you for who you are. You are the son of God. You are my savior and you are my redeemer. I choose right now to step off the throne. I am not my own God and I repent of living that way. I place you on the throne of my life. Be my leader, my master, be my God. I wanna serve your purpose. Yes, forgive my sin, cleanse my life, make me right with God but I surrender to you. Let your resurrection power flow in me today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. That's good right there. Get yourself centered on him. Reach down now, grab that communion cup that you received on the way in. We're gonna celebrate this together, but let's sing this as a prayer. Christ alone, let's just Christ declare that. Alone. says about Jesus death on the cross by his stripes we are healed right now as we prepare to take this in faith we thank you for the promise that Jesus you're able to make us whole all the way through body yeah our spirits made whole connected with you but even our minds and our hearts right now I pray from head to toe that God would begin to release his healing grace that he begin to bring you out of that that discouraged space and that he'd bring you into the joy that only the Holy Spirit can provide, that he'd bring healing and strength into your life now in Jesus' name. And let's just take the bread now in faith. Yeah, Jesus, we thank you that your blood was shed for us. We hold the cup as well, and we realize that your death on the cross has removed our need to carry around the shame and the guilt. We know that, that often we feel down and defeated just because we are walking around burdened by our past. And, and, and in this moment, as we celebrate what you did for us on the cross, we recognize that your death on the cross was enough. Nothing has to be added to it because you said it is finished. So we let go of the guilt and the shame and we receive your love and acceptance right now. In Christ, we receive your acceptance. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take the cup. Yeah. All right, let me say a couple things before we um, close the service. First, if you're new to Allison Park Church and you're like, I need some connection, I, I need to find out what to do here, um, there's next steps in the lounge afterward. Well, we'd love to have that conversation with you to help you get the process started. Life group starts this week, right? We're kicking it off again. So maybe you need to be reminded to get back into your group. Or if you're looking for a group, there's some tables out there with people that are helping. That helps you to find those seven friends, right? That you need, begin that journey in that way. But let me remind you this one last thing. If you are feeling alone, if you're suffering, if you're unseen, if you need support, if you need a strategy session, if you need something, listen, we are not too busy, okay? Reach out, 
Raise your hand, send an email, send a text. Find someone here because we want to be in your life. And if we have too many phone calls, that's a good thing because we wanna start to change that reality here, okay? I pray now that God would bless you with unusual peace today. That there would be courage that would return to your spirit, that he would give you the awareness of his goodness and that he would by his grace carry you in this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna sing our way out. God bless, guys. Oh Christ. Hey, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the last minute. All right, hey, before you head out, we got three things we want you to know. First off, man, that message from Pastor Jeff was awesome, you know, talking about soul health. And, uh, you know, the biggest thing that stuck out to me was making sure you have the right people in your life to surround you. And so, man, it's really important for you to do that. And the best way you can do that really here is to get more connected. So if you need any help finding out what that is, make sure just to drop that in the chat. Hey, I'd love to get more connected and, and, and get supported here. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to partner with you in prayer. So if you have a prayer request, we would love uh, to pray with you about that. So you can say, you can text pray for me uh, to 97,000 and we'll get that to you and we'll be able to pray with you. Or you can fill out a virtual, virtual connect card uh, on our website or our app and we can pray with you as well. Yeah, and if you would like to give today, you can give on the APC app, our website, or text any dollar amount to 84321. Uh, but if it's one of your first few times here, there is no pressure for you to be a part of this. We're just so glad that you're here. But either way, that's gonna be it for us here. So we will see you later. Bye.